Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here this morning. Uh, I'm Senator Andrew Matthews, uh, and I have the privilege of being the GOP lead on the Energy Committee here in the Minnesota Senate. We're here to talk about today uh, the uh, bill that's coming up on the floor today and also what our plan uh, would be uh, instead. Uh, today, the Democrats are bringing uh, the blackout bill, the 100% uh, mandate bill that is going to uh, reduce the reliability of Minnesota's energy grid, putting us at greater risk of blackouts at the times when our citizens need it the most. It will also lead to higher costs for consumers who are already struggling with rising energy costs. Democrats are pushing for strict mandates to force utilities and our energy producers to use carbon-free energy at a pace that current technology does not support, hoping that cleaner technology becomes available along the way up to the goals is not a plan. Without access to reliable energy, uh, Minnesota's energy grid will not be able to keep up with demand during peak times, and the times that we will likely need it most is when it's really cold in the winter or it's really hot in the summer. Uh, energy experts say that this blackout bill uh, will contribute to rising energy costs estimated to be as much as $1,600 to $1,800 per year on Minnesota families uh, and make it harder for Minnesotans to afford basic needs in their own home. And that does not even include the outside costs that will trickle down, the energy costs will impact the cost you pay for all your goods, uh, the cost you pay at the grocery store, the cost for transporting uh, goods uh, that we do, that we produce, agriculture, mining, retail costs, all of these uh, get passed on to the consumer, which will even further increase the price uh, beyond that 16 to $1,800 level. So we support uh, advancing technologies, including renewable energy technologies, as part of our energy portfolio, but we cannot leave families out in the cold. Uh, we should continue to pursue an all of the above strategy, and as these renewable technologies gain in strength, the market uh, will include them in numbers. That's why we're here today uh, to introduce what the Senate Republicans uh, want to have as our energy policy, the A-plus energy plan. And what, that, uh, what those stands for is, uh, would be for allowing more technologies like nuclear technology with uh, lifting the nuclear moratorium. It would, our plan would be affordable by having more forms of baseload energy available for Minnesotans to access to help with the cost of your underlying energy. It would be always on. Reliability is a key factor for having uh, a strong energy grid in Minnesota. And while everybody talks about wanting energy affordable and reliable, uh, the Senate Republicans A plus energy plan can actually back that up by having more forms of baseload generation allowed in Minnesota and available to Minnesotans. And we want an all of the above approach. We are, we are not against, we have supported uh, wind and solar uh, as it has grown in the state of Minnesota and around the region. But we also want to have these key forms of baseload energy uh, still in Minnesota. We have two nuclear plants today, uh, and we need to have more. We need to lift the moratorium and explore uh, adding to nuclear in Minnesota. Uh, we need to keep uh, the natural gas that we have. That is a very, very clean form of energy that is vital to having a strong, secure uh, baseload energy. Uh, we need to open up more access uh, to large hydro. Uh, there's a number of clean energy technologies that we could have in the mix, but are going to be on the outside looking in under the Democrats' blackout bill plan. Uh, I'm gonna have Senator Rarick uh, share uh, some of the news that has, uh, and some of the evidence that has backed some of this up and why we're bringing our a energy plan to you today. 
Yes, thank you for being here, um, Senator Jason Rarick, and I've had the privilege of serving on the energy committees uh, since being in the legislature, and it's something that I've uh, really dug deep into, and since I've been on, um, my what I've talked about is there are three things we have to always keep in mind. We can be good stewards, we can be cleaner, but we have to be affordable and reliable. Minnesotans expect the lights to come on when they turn the switch on. And back in 2005, we put some plans in place to move towards a cleaner energy source and program in Minnesota. 20 years later, um, we see in the Star Tribune recently, we're getting very close to that. We're at about 25%. This plan by the Democrats is saying in another five years, we're going to go from that 30% to 80%, and then in another 10 years, all the way to 100%. That, the technology just is not going to get us there. Um, we can be cleaner, but technology is going to get us there. If we follow that technology, it will allow us to remain affordable and to remain reliable. And as Senator Matthews talked about the nuclear moratorium, uh, the two of us recently toured the Idaho National Falls Nuclear Laboratories, and they're working on some great innovation in small modular nuclear. Um, this has a great potential uh, to be an energy source uh, going into the future, but right now Minnesota utility companies cannot even begin to consider that in their plans because of the moratorium. So that's one of the reasons, main reasons, we are asking to lift that moratorium so they can at least begin looking at those technologies and incorporating them into future plans. Um, you know, one of the other things too, this is, this bill is moving so fast. Um, Minnesotans have not had an opportunity to dig into the details of the plan to understand what is truly being proposed. And that, that is something we've been trying to do. We tried to do that in committee, bring up some of those questions, um, and we will be doing that again today on the Senate floor, asking questions, helping Minnesotans understand just what is in this bill and what it will mean and why we believe, um, as Senator Matthew said, the potential for the blackouts are going to be at the worst times possible. Um, when it is at the coldest temperatures, that is when our wind turbines stop producing and actually become energy users. And typically at that time, solar is at a far diminished amount of production. Um, and that is when everybody needs their electricity on to run their furnaces or to run their air source heat pumps. So that is why we have such a concern there. And when the temperatures are at its highest is another time, and that's when people expect their air conditioners to be on so that they can get relief from the heat and the humidity. Um, you know, we've also heard from MISO, they manage the grid. Um, they have said we have become, we have come very close a couple of times with having either brownouts or rolling blackouts. Um, we are that close right now to having uh, emergency situations. And if we push this faster than technology can support it, we will start seeing those blackouts at the most inopportune times. So we're, we're trying to uh, get that word out and help Minnesotans understand just uh, what the potentials are if we move too quickly without the technology there. Thank you. So when Minnesota first did uh, the first iteration of the renewable energy standard, they took a uh, a dedicated methodical time of working through all the issues with stakeholders, of talking to people on both sides of the aisle, uh, worked through the situation together, had a plan that was supported by a large bipartisan majority of both the House and the Senate. And it was in split government at the time where uh, the legislature and the executive uh, were not in the same party. They all worked together to pass uh, the initial plan. What we are seeing here today is a hyperpartisan push that's going through on largely party line vote. Uh, it was strict party line for everything we brought up in, uh, in committee, and uh, it is not following uh, Minnesota's history of when you have large, significant changes in energy policy slowing down, making sure you do your work thoroughly, do it right, have all parties engaged, have all parties bought in. That is not how the blackout bill uh, has been moving. So with that, uh, Senator Rarick and I are open to a few questions. Senator, um, 
a large part of the Democrats' bill just relies on the judgment of the PUC, it seems, like to determine off-ramps or what's affordable or reliable or just kind of governing this process. Tell me, do you have confidence in the PUC to, to handle that? Um, do you think that they're good at what they do or you're worried about their judgment on those sorts of issues? Tell me about that aspect of the bill. My biggest concern is the standard that's laid out in the legislation, that there is a discussion about supposed off-ramps in the future, but there's not really a clear, tangible goal of what that would look like. And we brought amendments that said, why don't we put something tangible on it, put some teeth on it. One of them that I did was, if Minnesota has a significant blackout, Let's make that an off-ramp. Let's kick off of this, get back to the drawing board, make sure we do it right. That got voted down on a party line vote. And so just reading through the legislation, I'm not, I don't see a sincere off-ramp that is actually uh, able to be met by a utility. And I've asked that question going, what would the actual scenario look like that would qualify uh, for this off-ramp? And that's the difficulty uh, that I see with that piece. Regardless of their judgment, you just think the bill's not strong enough to allow them to grant an off ramp. That's my uh, that's my interpretation. Yes. Or big utilities like Excel say that they can meet the uh, the standard. Uh, that they're not worried about it. So if they're not worried, why are you? Because that's only one part uh, of who generates electricity for Minnesotans. Uh, they are in the best position to meet it. Uh, they had plans for 2050. Uh, they, they've even told us they're not sure how they're going to do 2040, but they are the closest to being able to shift and do that. Uh, outside of the areas for those big utilities, a lot of Minnesotans are served by a local electrical co-op, a small town muni. Uh, I am in a community that runs a small diesel generator uh, for powering the energy uh, for my entire city. Heard of another one yesterday in northern Minnesota that has a small muni generation based off wood. Uh, there's a lot of areas where uh, these types of, uh, or of generators, our co-ops and our munis, are going to be in a very difficult position uh, to meet the standard. The fallback will likely be that they will have to buy some form of renewable energy credit uh, to compensate, which is just going to be another added unnecessary cost that ends up getting passed to the consumers of the people that they serve. So you end up getting a lose-lose there. You have the higher energy rates overall, and then you have to pay for uh, the credit that the government's forcing you to pay for for not meeting the standard, and these folks will get hit twice. So uh, not all of Minnesota is on the same footing of where, uh, how easily uh, this can be afforded. That's why we would, uh, we would rather this market-based approach. Groups like Excel have already been moving forward on their own. They have set many of these things as their own company goals. That's been fine. Uh, it's a free market and that is their prerogative to do and their customers have been asking them to do that. But we are unnaturally forcing other areas of the state of Minnesota uh, to move in a much more harmful way that they are not uh, in the same position that the big, uh, that the big uh, generators like Excel are. Should Minnesotans be concerned about the longevity of your plan? Because there are very few people um, in the utility industry are still trained and skilled in nuclear energy practices. Are you worried about skilled utility energy workers with nuclear energy backgrounds soon becoming a thing of the past? People aren't really being trained in that anymore. Um, I don't know where uh, your facts and questions are coming from. Nuclear, nuclear is uh, still a very strong component around the nation. And uh, opening it up here in Minnesota opens up that need to make sure we train those workers to do it. Uh, the longevity piece uh, pops up often in renewable energy. The lifetime of a solar or a wind farm uh, has ended up, we've, we've ended up replacing some of these uh, facilities in less than 20 years. Uh, so there's pieces that go with that that stretch across uh, multiple segments, multiple forms of generation. So 
Uh, no, I think the, uh, the demand will meet the need, uh, and I don't want the government to artificially uh, shut off the demand with this moratorium in place saying you can't uh, come in and add to nuclear in Minnesota. On nuclear, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't recall hearing any of our utilities saying that they're interested in building new nuclear plants, even the smaller modular ones that you guys toured. Um, it, uh, so your call for lifting the moratorium, what difference does that make? They're not allowed to put it in their plans right now under this moratorium. And we're not saying that we're forcing companies to build more nuclear. It's the tool that should be in the toolbox. And there could be a technology for nuclear. Uh, I've seen, as Senator Rarick said, we went out and looked at what some of these next generation advanced nuclear reactors are. There could be a second generation that is available five, 10 years from now that's even not conceptualized today and maybe a version in the future uh, makes sense and would be a good integration here in Minnesota. So it's not necessarily looking at today, it is looking at uh, this range between now and 2040, 2050, and it's not a tool that we're allowed to have in the toolbox. Did you wanna add to any of that since you've done nuclear a lot? Yeah, I, I would follow up, um, you know, in many other states, um, utilities are looking at these. Uh, Wyoming right now is in the process of um, building one of these uh, new uh, reactors and putting it into a test mode. And like I said, there are seven different prototypes that are in line to be tested in Idaho Falls. So the utilities uh, across the country are looking at that as the potential um, things that they could be looking for their future plans as they're retiring coal and, and other fossil fuel facilities. And the other thing that's so great about the potential is because of the modular nature and they can put multiple in the same place to be additive to each other, they could be put in the same place that many of these fossil fuel plants are and the transmission is already there. We will not have to rework that infrastructure. So, and, and then the other side, um, again, talking about technologies that are emerging, um, they told us as well that the nuclear can be that backup to wind and solar um, when they're not producing, they can produce electricity, but when wind and solar do produce, they can be transitioned over very easily to produce hydrogen, which is another one of the emerging technologies that um, is being talked about, whether that's in the transportation sector or, or storage sector. So all these potentials that are there, and Minnesota right now is saying, we, we won't even allow our utilities to think about that. And so that's what we're asking for when we ask for the lift of the moratorium is allowing them to begin considering that as part of their future plans. Um, and I think most people would uh, have a hard time believing that a nuclear facility like we have in Prairie Island or Monticello is what is going to be built again. It is going to be these new technologies uh, that we're looking at um, that are not only, uh, they're safer, but far more flexible in, in what they can do. Do Republicans support setting any standard, you, you know, maybe 2050, 100% by 2050, or is the idea of a st standard period sort of untenable? Um, in regards to any standard, I've said it looks like that most utilities are moving this way anyways. So why the need to put it into law as a standard? We have, a, we have the current renewable energy standard in place that helped jumpstart the conversation. Um, so uh, it's, not really, it's not really aligned with the market-driven discussion that we are trying to take things today. Um, not opposed to companies setting goals. Uh, that is very good, that, that allows them to be innovative, uh, but we don't need an artificial government standard. How many amendments might there be on the bill today? Uh, we are going to have, we're gonna have quite a few. We're working through uh, the final list. Uh, you saw if you followed uh, the committee hearing on it, we brought a number of them to committee. Uh, some of that you'll see on the floor are some from committee, uh, some are not. Um, and we're going to have a very, very robust discussion uh, on this bill on the floor. Senators, why propose this plan now? Um, it sounds like a lot of the things you guys are proposing um, 
House Republicans also tried to propose in their amendment. So uh, what, what makes you hopeful that your plan will uh, be amenable to Senate Democrats? My hope is that uh, everyday Minnesotans in communities across the state see the contrast of what uh, the Democrats are pushing through at a fast and furious pace, uh, what will be left on the outside looking in that will not be allowed under their plan, and what our plan would be wanting to have more things available uh, for Minnesotans to use. So it is some to the people that are in the Capitol building here, and it is drawing a plan and a contrast for uh, Minnesotans around the state. And, and then also to add on to that, I think uh, Senator Matthews brought this up earlier, uh, you know, energy plans for the state have typically been worked on over a period of years rather than weeks. And uh, you know, I carried the ECO Act a c number of years ago. That took almost four years uh, in negotiating with all the different stakeholders. And there are still some who don't believe that was even you know, right after four years of work. And we're watching that to see if there are tweaks that will help our cooperatives uh, meet those conservation goals or not. Um, but that's what we're ultimately asking for. You know, um, Senator Senjum had worked for years in this area looking at um, future plans and um, had not seen that come to fruition. But we're using a lot of the things in, in our A-plus plan that Senator Senjum had established and put in place and trying to follow up on that and build. And, and we don't expect that it would necessarily happen this year, but it is a discussion that we have to continue to have as we move towards this clean energy future. Um, so it, it just, it should be something that happens um, over a course of time that we're really engaging um, everyone who is involved and, and not something that we're rushing through in a matter of weeks. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I'm just a regular Minnesotan, so I'm not press or anything. Wonderful. <laughs> I just have a quick question. What would this cost Minnesotans to not go with the A-plus plan? Um, it would be a lot less uh, because it would be access to uh, more of these technologies. It would hopefully be uh, along the lines of where we are today with whatever built-in natural inflation that happens. Uh, but uh, under the blackout bill plan, we'll likely see a spike. Uh, it will be an unnatural upward curve of what energy costs will be. Uh, our plan, the goal of our plan, would be to continue on uh, the normal uh, cost curve uh, that we are on today. So we want it to keep it affordable uh, and keep it in line uh, with what we are generating here today. I'm sorry, I just have one question. If we're ending a ban on nuclear power construction, wouldn't that occur some type of cost? It does, uh, but the, the cost benefit analysis, uh, it, it becomes reliable energy that's always on 24-7, uh, and nuclear is one of the best uh, forms of technology. And that's what's built into uh, the rates. That's what they would bring to the Public Utilities Commission with their plan. And they have to prove that it is uh, a good, affordable plan in the mix. Uh, it still goes through the same regulatory uh, and cost process uh, that everything else would, but be uh, reliable and affordable. So to, to add on to that real quick. Um, and when we talk about the cost of building the nuclear, there is a huge cost to building the wind turbines and the solar um, arrays that are needed to get to the amount of generation we need as well. And that's why we believe um, the add, building into the infrastructure around the nuclear will actually be cheaper than ha with everything that would go into the wind turbines and the solar arrays. Thank you, everyone.